washing your hair in slow motion in a basin. Because you're worth it. This is Mirror. Hey everybody, welcome to Seen and Heard. This is the podcast where two entertainment assistants go through the sight and sound top 100 greatest films of all time list. I'm Greg. I'm Jackie. And we're back this week for our first Tarkovsky on the list. Maybe you've heard of him. I feel like that joke is sold at this point. I always pull that stupid <laughs> shit. Uh, this is Mirror from 1975. This is number 19 on the list. It is number 19. Number even 19. though there is no number 18. Um, which is so weird because last time we were at the top of the list, it was Persona and Persona has 48 votes and it is tied with seven samurai and they're both number 17 on the list. This week's movie right under Persona, it's number 19. It has 47 votes. Explain that to me. Like someone from Sight and Sound, please explain this to us. Well, it's because there's still only a hundred movies on there. So if there are multiple... Uh, movies at the same number then they're gonna skip some numbers just because otherwise they'd have more than a (laughs) hundred why do they have movies with multiple numbers then oh the ties but then yeah because they they didn't want to break the ties which i feel like they should have but they didn't Mm, honestly they should ask us for the next list they should they should have us weigh in and we will break the ties yeah (laughs) totally uh, I want to take this opportunity to uh, reiterate that we will be taking the month of November off. There will be no seen and heard for the month of November because uh, it's almost our year mark and we just need a little bit of a break. So we're going to, you know, we each write and direct and stuff. So we're going to be working on other projects during that time. But I promise, I swear, we'll be back in December, the first Tuesday in December, which I believe is December 6th for Singing in the Rain. So it'll oh be our, our first film back. So yes. I'm really looking forward to both the break and also the coming back. Me too. <laughs> and we will be back. We're not just saying that. Yeah, that's true. I feel like podcasts sometimes just kind of take these breaks and then they lag coming back or they never come back. But we're coming back because we're looking forward to the movies in the middle of the list so much. Yes. Yes, we are. And we're so excited. It's weird. It's I feel like. We're still, I feel like we've been doing this for a year, but we haven't made that much progress. We're still at the top, like the 20s of both ends of the list. I think because we're doing this ping pong order, it makes it seem like we're chiseling away less. But actually we have, I mean, we've done 40 something odd episodes. And uh, I know some of those were films that were not on the list, but most of them are. Yeah. So, you know, we're almost, we're almost halfway through the list. But still, we're just getting started, <laughs> and obviously, there's a top 250 sight and sound. And so once we, we have finish, a new list coming out. Yeah, there's a new so list gonna coming. So we're going to have fun with that. Yeah. So we won't be going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> you can't get rid of us. Uh, anyway, before we get into Mirror, what have you been watching lately, Jackie? Um, I watched Patterson by Jim Jarmusch. Oh, yeah. I, I like that one. I loved it. I loved it. It was like, I think, you know, I'm trying to figure out how I decided to sit down and watch that the other day because I I, I almost want to say because we because I watched Mirror and it's this movie with like poetry read aloud in the film. I I think I was doing some research about Mirror and then someone referenced it or I, I have no idea how I got the idea to pop into my head. Let me sit down and watch Patterson. But I'm so happy I did because it is kind of like not I mean, not really, but it was just interesting that there are two movies with poetry read aloud. Patterson is so beautiful and simple and lovely and really heartbreaking. Like I it's it's heartwarming and heartbreaking. I loved it. I don't want to give too much away, but I just think that Adam Driver's performance in it is so nuanced the ending makes me smile while also making me extremely sad and that's what you want out of a movie i think it's too it's like i love jarmusch i feel Mm -hmm. like a lot of his films are slightly detached and like very cool and what i love about patterson is how warm and almost like 
it's so unembarrassed to just be oh like genuine God. and I love it. And that's yeah. like the theme of the movie really is yeah. just like being unembarrassed about being normal, not being on unemba- being unembarrassed, being content, being in love. Like it's just, I love it. Uh, so that's what I watched. I also watched the man who knew too much, but the fifties version with Jimmy Stewart and Doris day. Was that your first time? Yeah. Have you seen it? That's the only, I actually have not seen the Peter Lorre one. I've only seen the Jimmy Stewart one. I haven't one. seen the Peter Lorre one either, but yeah. the plots are very different. Um, I liked it. It's like... It's, it's fluff. It's nowhere near... Yeah, it's nowhere near anything like any important Hitchcock, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, it's it's like really entertaining. Yeah. It, it's just him in like his golden period, just like as like a, a movie making machine. Exactly. Doris Day was so interesting because I don't know. I just, I always, when I think Doris Day, I just think of like 60s sex comedies and with Rock Hudson. Yeah. And so, like, seeing her in a Hitchcock and like she is this Hitchcock blonde in this movie. She's even wearing a gray suit at one point. Yeah. And uh, it was interesting. I thought she did a great job. I think Kay Sarah Sarah comes from yes, that movie. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, what have you been watching? Not that much. Yeah. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> I did uh, revisit uh, an old favorite, Poltergeist, which I hadn't seen in a couple of years, but I grew up on that movie. In fact, I was thinking about it and I was like, is this the first horror movie I ever saw? And I think it might have been. Again, it's like PG. You've seen, have you seen Poltergeist? Greg. It's like a Spielberg movie. It's like <laughs> PG. It's like a PG Spielberg movie. I actually Spielberg haven't seen it. No, I haven't. It's cool just because like that and E.T. were released like a week apart or something. And uh, even though Toby Hooper directed Poltergeist, the word on the street is that Spielberg did ended up doing most of the directing because it feels just like a yeah. Spielberg movie and not a Toby Hooper movie. Not to discredit Toby Hooper any in any way because I love like when Toby Hooper was good, he was really good. Like <clears throat> Texas Chainsaw Massacre, one and two, but it's great and it still holds up and uh, it's just a good time. It's not particularly scary. Like it's scary when you're like six years old, mm. but I think that it's so big now because it's such a, such a like special effects extra- extravaganza that it's not scary as an adult. Like it's not subtle. It's not, you know, I, you're safe to watch Poltergeist. I, I sure. I'm sure I am. You said Texas Chainsaw Massacre and it reminded me of this hilarious video I have to show you of this is my Isabel Huppert plug for the episode. It's like this quick interview someone's doing with her. It's like really quick cuts. And it's like um, the question, it just like comes on the screen. And it says, what movie affects you the most? And she says, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Or like, what movie affects you the same time every single time you see it? Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And then uh, what movie do you have the most like emotional response to? And she says, Texas Chainsaw <laughs> Massacre. And then she says... C'est un très beau film. Like, she literally calls it a beautiful movie. It is. Honestly, it is. And it, I just thought that was hilarious. And I that still, was my plug. I revisited the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre a couple years ago because I hadn't seen it since I was like a teenager in high school. And I was genuinely shocked at how potent it still is and how it's like head and shoulders above in terms of just like what a raw, crazy experience it is, like in terms of like Halloween and Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street, which are all very tame in comparison. The first uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is still like really rough, like it's nightmare fuel. Oh. And the second one is basically a comedy. He's basically making, I, I that's a new discovery of mine and I love it to death, Texas Chainsaw 2 with Dennis Hopper, which is basically a satire of the first movie. And it's this weird, dark comedy, but it's also still like really intense. And I love both one and two. I think they're like truly great films. That's interesting. One of my friends told me, he's like, you should watch horror movies because it makes you think of like how bad those people have it. It's true. Like they're not, you know. Yeah, at least it's not you getting diced up out there. But then it, then I stay up thinking about I that. Know. Yeah, you know, horror movies when I was a kid did so much psychological damage. Exactly. <laughs> and even non-horror movies, but yeah, that's a conversation for another time. Should we get into this week's movie? Let's do it. From 1975, this is Andrei Tarkovsky's Mirror.
Mirror was released in 1975. It is a Soviet-Russian film directed by Andrei Tarkovsky, co-written by Tarkovsky and Alexander Mishirin. Cinematography by Georgi Rehrberg. Music by Edward Artemyev. The film is an exploration into the dreams, memories, and national identity of an unseen poet named Alexei. He remembers his pre-war childhood days spent at his family cabin, where he was raised by his stern but sensitive mother, Maria, after his father left the family. In modern times, Alexei's relationship with his mother is somewhat strained, as is his relationship with his ex-wife, Natalia, and they argue about the future of their young son, Ignat. Historical footage from World War II, the Spanish Civil War, and the Sino-Soviet border conflict are intercut within the film as characters meditate on Russia's role in the world. Alexei remembers being rifle trained as a child during World War II and a brief moment of reunion when his father returns from the war. Finally, Alexei is on his deathbed with an unnamed illness. And one last Oniric sequence takes us to the countryside where he was raised, an image of his young mother and father in love intercut with his mother walking through the fields as an old woman. The film stars Margarita Terkova as Maria and Natalia. She plays both characters. Ignat Daniltsev as Ignat and Alexei as a youth and Oleg Yankovsky as the father. Tarkovsky's own mother played the older Maria in the film. Fun fact. Throughout the film, poetry composed and read by the director's father, Arseny Tarkovsky, plays over sequences. The first version of the script was written in 1968. It was titled Confession and it was made up of 28 scenes split between Tarkovsky and Mishirin. Split between three forms, interviews with Tarkovsky's mother filmed with hidden cameras, recreations of his childhood memories, and newsreels for historical context. However, the Soviet Film Committee, the USSR State Committee for Cinematography, had a problem with the non-linear and abstract elements of the film. He went on to make Solaris. Then the Film Committee had a new head who approved the script in 1973, but they got rid of the whole mother interview stuff. The Country Home of Alexei is a faithful adaptation of Tarkovsky's real childhood home. And he had a really miserable time editing this. At one point, there were like 20 different edits. And apparently, yeah, it was torture. The name of the film was decided while shooting. Other titles included A Bright Day, Confession, Redemption, Martyrology, which I thought was <laughs> interesting. And apparently he was originally thinking of casting one of our faves as the mother slash... Phoebe Anderson. Yes! Yeah. Uh, in the role of, yeah, the mother slash Natalia. But Margareta Tarakova looked just like his mother, apparently. And I think she's incredible. Because of its ethereal, abstract nature and mixed reviews, distribution was extremely limited. The committee did not allow it to screen at Cannes, but news of some critical success spread to New York, and European distribution came in 1978. That's all I got for specs on Mirror. I think that covers it, yeah. I mean... You do a good job seemed... with specs. Aw, thanks. <laughs> you do a good job with, like, uh, Pauline. Oh, thank you. And also introducing <laughs> us and signing off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what are your initial thoughts? So it's funny... I would I would count Tarkovsky among you know he's he's I I love I love his work he only made seven features in his lifetime, but each of them is incredibly special you know he's the kind of filmmaker that again his life unfortunately was cut short kind of early, but every film he made he approached in in the kind of the way that like Kubrick did or something like almost as if it would be his last like each film was so incredibly special and profound and. I, I just, he, there's such jewels, you know, like Tar Tarkovsky's filmography is like one jewel after the other. So I do have to say that this is the last of his films I saw. I've seen the other six much before this. In fact, I tried to watch this movie for the first time uh, four or five years ago. And I remember, I think I got like 10, 20 minutes in, maybe it was a little bit more, but I was just like not in the mood. I was like, oh, I can't do this right now. Like, especially when they started cutting in like newsreel footage and stuff. I was like, I was like, this is too dense right now. Like I'm not in the right headspace to see this. And so I turned it off and unfortunately didn't get around to seeing it again until we prepped for this episode this week. Also funny that 
<laughs> I'm actually like going through the Tintin books right now, and the one I just read the night before this was Tintin in the Land of the Soviets, which <laughs> what the which Tintin is, books? Yeah, You're the reading tin- those? Uh huh. Yeah, they're great. They're so really? good. But it's the first. So, so Tintin in the Land of the Soviets is a very like uh yeah, it's like a piece of right wing propaganda like oh against God. the soviet union so it's like a pretty uncomfortable read in that respect but i just thought it was funny that i i read that the night the night before That's i watched really this funny. but yeah so look i'm gonna be completely blunt about it this is my least favorite tarkovsky film as of now as of now there are some stunningly beautiful stretches in here of course the cinematography is just some of the best ever like all oh, of his films i mean it is yeah. truly like Like, you know, you take this footage to a DP and you're like, get me this look. Like, that's the look. And I mean, to say that his films are some of the most like sumptuously photographed films ever is like an understatement. Like his films are truly immersive. Like you could step into them. Like they're just so they're painterly. They're stark. They're just incredible. So despite some like really great stretches of this and for the first 30 minutes i was like this is a five like this is a fucking masterpiece all i could say in my head after the first like 30 to 45 minutes was like oh my god oh my god oh my god yeah unfortunately at a certain point the movie started to lose me and maybe this is just my own failings and maybe i'll come back to this movie in a few years and be like no actually this is a masterpiece not like i'm planning on doing that or you know i'm gonna come back to it for sure but and I don't dislike it, but I just think as far as Tarkovsky films go, for me, it's a little bit too jumbled. Like, mm-hmm. I, I kind of prefer when he has a little bit stronger of a narrative. And I I also like the impressionistic stuff. He does it well. And um, But for me, like, <laughs> this sounds really cliche to say, but like, an example of this movie that I like much more is Malik's Tree of Life because you yeah, get this impressionistic so mm-hmm. coming of age or not coming of age, but just like someone, a, a child, memories. a childhood yeah. remembered. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that movie somehow Malik kind of like pulls that off a little bit better than Tarkovsky. I think Tarkovsky's strengths are not necessarily an impressionism. Um, so again, I, I don't have an attack against this movie. Like this movie should have done this or should have done that. It just, at a certain point, it started losing me. And even though it's one of his shorter films, by the end, I was like kind of ready for it to be over. And it's really? it's sad for me to say, but again, there are some really breathtaking sequences in here. But at the end of the day, it just, it ranks at the bottom for me for wow. of Tarkovsky's work. Anyway, what about you? Well, I haven't seen, I've only seen Ivan's Childhood and this. This is like my second time watching this, actually. What was the first one you saw? Ivan's Childhood. Oh, okay. Good place to start, honestly. Yeah. You know, we we just did Persona. We've done Color of Pomegranates, these abstract impressionistic movies. And I and then we watched the, I watched this and I just am reminded so much each time I watch one of these what I love about them is I could just rewatch them constantly. Like I I don't think I can get sick of them. It's the joy of discovery. It's the joy of feeling a different way every time you watch it because you've noticed something new or you interpret something in a different way. And I've I've discovered really with this podcast, I think that I really like that. Um, This is such a deeply beautiful film. Actually, I think it is a masterpiece. (laughs) <laughs> good I, I, no most because, people do yeah i mean i'm in the minority because on this the one. way that the camera moves in this movie is otherworldly oh, yeah. it's another yeah. level of omniscient it's it's almost like god it is god like yeah. and i love the fact that you never see the protagonist you never see adult alexi's face um but well I you will... do see it for a second when when the, he's like laying down in the grass you see it for a brief second Laying down in the grass. Mm-hmm. When is he laying down in the grass? It's it's in the last like ten or fifteen minutes of the movie, and she's laying there with him. But you see, you see That's like his, his profile. Dad. Is it? Yeah. Oh, see, this movie lost me. But that's the dad because he's asking her, "What do you want, a boy or a girl?" Oh, okay. What are you, they're in love. You thought that was mother's son? I don't know. What, Greg? That's like one of my favorite parts. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm serious. Wow. I'm serious. But listen, I will admit the newsreel footage takes me out of it. It does. Also, the shooting. First of all, I like the Spanish Civil War footage. I think that's really cool. And the Matador, like, I love that stuff. But when it gets into the 
the rifle shooting it goes that on for too long. That takes me out of it. Yeah. That scene goes out for too goes on for too long, and it's not even Alexi. It's about this other little boy who I guess is from like Leningrad, but like, and I understand it's a, it's a it's a really sad way to depict a nation and a life at war. You know, a childhood where literally you need to learn how to shoot a gun. But something about it, I think it's because it's not actually about Alexi. It's about some random kid. My problem with it is that his filmmaking is so beautiful that it it's such a, and I'm, again, I'm sure he intended this, but it's so jarring when he just like holds on this newsreel footage. You're like, take me back to the movie. Like, tell me this in your movie. Don't just show me the footage. Yeah, but I also love, it. what I like about the newsreel footage is the added audio that mm. is put in. Like mm-hmm. when they're when they're walking through the water particularly yeah a lot of good water sounds in this movie <laughs> yeah, well he must have been having like a field day honestly that's one of the reasons that i love him so much because all of his movies there's running water somewhere like really it's like in this movie it's like running down the walls of the house and oh stuff God, like yeah so it's just like he understands he gets it so let's talk about tarkovsky because i know you want to <laughs> <laughs> so Tarkovsky would eventually leave the USSR to mm-hmm. make his last two movies abroad. And we saw this with Parajanov. It's the constraints of the Soviet Film Committee. These directors with incredible minds knew that they didn't belong in a world with censorship. Yeah. And um, he made Nostalgia. Oh. His last two movies were made abroad. Nostalgia in Italy, The Sacrifice in Sweden. My God. And he died in Paris. So he does have this very... this. Um, but it's funny because when he made this, he wasn't even like a displaced person. He was still living in the USS. Right. Just battling against but the there's censorship. So many, yeah. There's so many signs of this, of like living outside your country. And of course the whole thing, the whole thing with their Spanish friends. And yeah, it's like almost like he was thinking about it and like, it, like pre feeling this feeling because he knew that he had to leave. Yeah. Um, Bergman is a big Tarkovsky fan. Yeah, we've talked about this on the the last couple Bergmans we did. Yeah, they kind of like fed off of each other. And you can you can see it, right? Like in terms of, of course, why they loved each other so much. You know what's so funny? In that Bergman interview I watched for the Persona episode, the one with him and Liv and Bibi, he said in it like that he loves Tarkovsky so much, but like he would rather watch a random American Western than watch a Tarkovsky movie, what? which I think is so hilarious. Because <laughs> he's like... <laughs> He's like, and he said, I would rather watch that than a Bergman or Tarkovsky movie. Bergman said that himself <laughs> in the interview. Yeah, he's being cute. And he's being cute. And he's talking about how like, it's so real and it's so beautiful and like it's art. And then like, obviously, I don't know. It's like. Right. It's entertainment. Entertainment, entertainment yeah. versus art. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Tarkovsky wrote a book. Oh, I just want to say, I want to say too, that one of my favorite, and I'm not, I don't have the exact quote I'm paraphrasing, but. One of my favorite things that one filmmaker said about another filmmaker was Bergman about Tarkovsky. And Bergman said, I feel like the first time I saw a Tarkovsky movie, I was given a key to a room that I never had the key to before. I have that quote written here. It's, I mean, come on. What what better way to say it? Do you want me to read it? Yeah, read it. My discovery of Tarkovsky's first film was like a miracle. Suddenly, I found myself standing at the door of a room, the keys of which had until then never been given to me. It was a room I had always wanted to enter and where he was moving freely and fully at ease. Oh, God. It's so good. Beautiful. It's beautiful. And it's the perfect way to describe a Tarkovsky movie. I think even by today's standards, you watch a Tarkovsky movie and it's unlike anything you've ever seen. Yeah. And, you know, the committee, the Soviet film committee thought that he was elitist. But in doing my research, a lot of what came up was that Russian the Russian people in particular like Mirror is their favorite Tarkovsky movie Mm -hmm. which is so weird because it's like so abstract but he actually wrote a book about cinema called Sculpting in Time yes one of the classic like cinema texts and he and he quotes a letter he received from some random female worker like when Mirror was released it says everything that torments me everything I don't have and that I long for that makes me indignant or sick or suffocates me Everything that gives me a feeling of light or warmth and by which I live and everything that destroys me, it's all there in your film. This was her describing Mirror. Yeah. Uh, like, that is just beautiful to me. Like, well, that is incredible. He has another story. Sorry, I don't want to cut you off. But no, no. he has another story um, where he was saying how, like, some critics critics were sitting around and, like, arguing about the meaning of Mirror and um, having this, like, long discussion. And then... 
a, a cleaning woman walks in and she interrupts them and she says, it's very simple. A man fell ill and thought he might die. He remembered all the terrible things he'd done to others and wanted to apologize. That's all. Apparently that's what she said. And like Tarkovsky died. Like he just loved that. <laughs> and I think that that's beautiful. I, I, I love this movie because if you just have a little bit of context, I feel like everything is so clear. Everything is so free. Everything is so beautiful to just make you feel what you want to feel. You need a, I think you need a little bit of context, mm -hmm. but not that much. Yeah. And of course, the Russian people didn't need any context. Well, it should, it should be said, too, that when it first came out, people were completely divided on it. Like, people yeah. loved it and hated yeah. it. Yeah, it's, it's one of those films. You know, I think, I think this is why I put off watching this movie for this long, because I knew that it was divisive among Tarkovsky fans, and some considered it his greatest work and stuff, and so I wasn't... I almost like didn't want to watch it just because the Tarkovsky movies I know and love, I know and love. And it's like, <laughs> if that's like weird. Yes. Maybe it's kind of weird, but like there's something about, so there's a point in the movie in which Alexi literally says, this comes out of his mouth. He says, words can't really express everything a person feels. It's like they're too feeble. He literally says that in the movie. And I think what I love so much about Tarkovsky's films is that they are indescribable. Like never once in all the times I've seen um, Stalker and Nostalgia and stuff, I love the, those are probably my two favorites, especially Nostalgia. Like people love Stalker. Like that's like the, the big one that people know or Solaris. Nostalgia is might be my favorite. And that one is like, I don't know. I feel like you just don't hear that one brought up that much. I actually had the pleasure of seeing that one. Uh, on film at the Egyptian theater before they remodeled and like Netflix bought it. But it was a, it was like a spiritual experience. But um, what I love so much about his films is that I, you know what? I've never really tried to break any of them down because there is a quiet mysticism about them. There's a sort of very vague magical quality to all of his films. And I've just, I've, never wanted to go deeper <laughs> if that yeah. makes any sense and i think i like mirror the least because it requires the most digging but i don't think it does that's my that's my thing i and look at those examples that i just named I, like okay yes you need to know that during the spanish civil war um the soviet union uh evacuated a bunch of kids out of spain and into russia that's what that newsreel footage is where like the parents are saying goodbye first of all the music playing in that scene it's some like beautiful spanish song yeah and people are literally running in the streets and it's amazing i think that that one is uh, amazing y like you need to know that and then you just need to know like okay yeah like war has been raging on seamlessly forever in this country when this movie was made Yes, but like, okay, from a narrative standpoint, because most of his narratives are easy, like, they're easy to follow. I feel like saying easy to follow sounds so simple, but they're just like, they're laid out and therefore he can kind of do his magic with all the other stuff that he does so well. Whereas in this film, I was genuinely, and I know this is kind of the point of the movie, but I was genuinely struggling with like where we were, when we were, who we were with. Like that stuff. And again, maybe if I watch this movie a couple more times, I'll like get it down. But just on a first viewing, it was disorienting and not like in a pleasing way. Like, like again, I was with, I was really with this movie for the first, I want to say like 45 minutes. Can, can I just say the first sequence of like the first memory of mom sitting on the fence? That is incredible up oh, until yeah. the fire. And even the printing press part is amazing. Yes. yes. I, and, and that whole stretch, I was in love it's with the amazing. movie i was speechless and then it's sad when this happens and again this is just my emotional response to the movie but after that point after i'm trying to pinpoint a movie uh, trying to pinpoint a part in the movie and when it happened it's but I probably can't. when the first like newsreel footage starts coming up i think honestly like the matador like do you like the part i like, like the, the matador people? yeah i actually really like that part it's like as it kind of drones on and he uses that footage a little more it's the rifle shooting. I think it's the rifle shooting. I actually don't have a huge problem with the really? the non newsreel rifle stuff. I love it, that scene with the the military instructor, and he thinks that there's that grenade, but it's a fake grenade. Yeah, I but love that's that you can see though. you can see the pulse. In yeah, his that's head. crazy. That's that's the, those little touches is, are what Tarkovsky. But see, that does so part well. is confusing to me because I'm like, okay, 
did this kid think he was throwing off an actual grenade? Were they doing a practice run? Like, is this guy just so shell shocked that he didn't um, realize it was a dummy or, you know, like things like that. And I guess like it's all there and I kind of just said it, but (laughs) it's the weirdness of it all. It's like the kid, another kid pulls the pin, the kid rolls down, throws it. And then they all seem scared though. It's not just the shell shocked instructor. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, it's it, it just it lost me at a certain point, and unfortunately, sometimes you know that feeling like when you're watching a movie and it has you, and then it starts to lose you, and you're like you're hesitant. You're like, no, no, yeah. no, win me back, win me back. You can do it, and you're like rooting for it to win you back, and it just like doesn't quite. And I feel so silly saying that about Mirror of all things. Like I'm not talking about the new Mission Impossible movie or something. Like this is Mirror. Exactly, like I which understand. I think that if you watch it once more think you're gonna feel i honestly might it could very well be the case Um, it was it was a matter for me of just the way that it was put together like at a certain i loved obviously he loves playing around with like different like sepia toned versus black and white versus color he's done that in a lot of his other films i think my issue with it is and i can sense that he had trouble putting it together because i think in this final edit for me at least it just doesn't quite sing the way that it should in the way that like look at tree of life Mm -hmm. of like Mm -hmm. all of like that movie has you the whole time and i think it's doing a very similar thing and it for me tree of life just kind of like i'm probably i'm probably gonna get roasted for saying this but no i don't think so because i think tree of life is kind of seen as one of those oh like baby's first art film or something i think it's a great movie it's 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 a masterpiece i think it's a masterpiece too and it's actually i remember one time i was browsing through the top 250 like i said like okay what's under number 100 on this list and like if not the next one or the one below it is tree of life Mm -hmm. and it's like so new it's like the newest one it's got to be the newest one in the top 200 for now until the new list yeah Yeah. i love tree of life no it's great i still remember Um, seeing in the theater and there was a a sign outside the box office that's like no refunds will be given for tree of life (laughs) so you could just imagine all these people like yo what's the new brad pitt movie and they like go and they're like what the fuck i never saw it in a theater that's been my dream is to see it in a theater it's never lined up it's but it's it it's come along a few times with the american cinematheque and for some reason i just couldn't go next time you gotta go i have to it's one of those i i really have to you think that's an apt comparison right this in tree of life 100 percent. so this is let's talk about this sorry i'm flipping the page (laughs) Um, I think that this movie is a like it's the hazy world of memories. Yeah, but it's also almost about the way that history repeats itself. Like how we are the essence of what came before us. How we as humans seem to be on this cycle. Well, just the of, very like, fact repeated, that yeah, the very fact that they're played by the same people. Exactly, right? the same actress plays yeah. the mom. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. we have the same heartbreaks, the same wars, the same love. It's just like. There's one poem in it that I really, really love. It's the one It's the one about everything is immortal. And I realize it plays during like the Sino-Soviet border footage. Um, but it's that poem about how everything is immortal. Do you remember that one? Yeah. And it's so arresting because I feel like a popular subject of art is like the transient nature of life and how everything changes. But for a poem to just come out and say... Everything is immortal. Neither darkness nor death exist on this earth while we're literally watching war footage. Yeah. And then it also says the grandfathers and grandchildren are at the same table. Like it has some line about that. Again, you have the same actors playing different generations of people who are related. And then another another line from it I love is I'll summon up any century at will. And that's what he's doing with this movie, right? He's going he's literally summoning up different centuries at will. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's beautiful. And it's like, of course, we can take the name Mirror. Like, it could be just him, like, reflecting on his life and his soul. Or, like, him reflecting the same path his dad went on. Because, like, or the character, not Tarkovsky. Because the dad also is, you know, the parents were divorced. Or, again, it could just be the way that everything reflects itself. Life reflects itself. Humans reflect other humans. Like, I and I love that. I love that. What Like, and the images, it's not just like it's not just the poetry obviously it's it's mom young in a towel and then looking in a mirror and she's old like mm-hmm. it's i don't know it's i, I think know it's beautiful. yeah there's so much here like i i love it it's like i i simultaneously love this movie but i'm like frustrated with it i like love it and then i'm also have my reservations about it but it's like 
when it's when it does that stuff like that scene where she's looking in the mirror and she's old it's it's like so good like yeah. there's nothing like it and it takes that again like nothing needs to be said like it's pure visual storytelling yeah. even though there is this great poetry by his father over the movie and there's a de- there's a it's decent lovely. amount of dialogue too yeah but like yeah no i don't <sighs> and then yeah no go ahead i was just about to say some of my, my i feel like my favorite tarkovsky movies have less dialogue like nostalgia which is like long stretches with no one saying a thing or like stalker yeah. too which has a little more than nostalgia but it's uh, you should you're you are gonna love those movies jackie like if you love mirror i know you are in for such a treat i'm so excited i have such a busy weekend otherwise i was literally just gonna sit home and watch stalker and nostalgia i really wish i could and uh, don't miss the sacrifice with Erlen josephson he's in nostalgia too though Is oh yeah 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 wait 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 uh yes yeah. that's right that's right he is look at me i know about it even though i haven't seen it <laughs> um but greg don't you love when this movie gets really ghostly no i'm <laughs> just kidding but yes. there's a ghost in the house of course and it's um it's so great and again it's during that first sequence which i love when she's visited by the doctor which is so random but great yeah. i yeah. love it um the woman disappears and like the the steam from the, her her cup her so there's mug. that stuff which yeah. is great and of course that is about like the national identity of russia and those letters that are being read um which is again like deja vu you know there's um with the coin you know when he's when alexi picks up the coin that his mom dropped on the floor and he gets that shock yeah. and he's like oh i feel like this has happened before and then we it leads into that scene with the mysterious ghostly woman yeah. but i mean in the house like after she talks to the doctor we're back at like the first sequence after she talks to the doctor and she walks she's walking towards the cabin like a bottle just falls off the windowsill did That's you right. notice yeah. that uh-huh. and then again when she says like there's a fire by the way i love when she's like there's a fire but don't scream yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when they're running away and again like a bottle falls off the table out of nowhere and just the yeah. way that shot them looking at the fire through the mirror the way it moves through the rooms I mean, it's like there's a there's uh, a reason why that's one of the most famous shots in like cinematic history it's amazing yeah do you think that what's the little so the people who discover the fire they start talking and they're like oh um oh clanka like where is he like he could be in there and they cry out they go like clanka and then he emerges out of nowhere but in alexi's home Mm -hmm. and he goes what is it like i'm here but no one responds i think clanka's dead i think he's a ghost i think he died in that fire interesting see now i'm more interested right isn't (laughs) that like because it's just so odd. Why would he shoot it like that? Why would it be like that? Why would it be so mysterious? Well, let's here while we're on the topic of magic and ghosts and stuff, let's talk about that entry, that intro video. Oh my god! And then let's talk about also, it. yeah. Let's and also the levitation, which is the the, the elephant in the room. I love it. I love it. Ooh, okay. The intro, which is a young boy getting some sort of like hypnotherapy to cure him of his stutter. Mm -hmm. What is it? It's, it's just so funny because Alexi turns on a TV and it seems like he's watching that on TV. Yeah. But I think the only thing you can take away from it is the ending when he goes like, I can speak. And then it's just like the credits of mirror. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I what think is so it? Too. It ties in in some weird it's, way. I, it's just like it's definitely supposed to be TV because you can see the boom in it, and you like, can see the boom. That's yeah. not something that Tarkovsky like he was so like painterly and such a perfectionist that like that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, the boom is hilarious. I think it's just like it's his way of like because it. She says about like tension, right? She goes like, "I'm taking all the tension away from your head, um, away from your." mouth and i'm putting it into your hands like she's like moving this tension and then he can like speak clearly so maybe it's just like it's almost like tarkovsky like getting this all off his chest or i don't know i honestly don't know i don't know it's so mesmerizing (laughs) and it's so it's such an enigma it's like i don't know it reminds me a little bit of but not really do you remember in a serious man the coen brothers movie Mm-hmm. You know the opening of that movie where it's With just the, a random scene yes. in a random village? Yeah, about the uh, Dibuk or something. Yeah. yeah. It kind of reminds me of that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although that one has like a little bit clearer of a thread to like the actual theme of the movie. Right. Well, 
I mean, who's to say here? I'm I'm not quite sure what he's getting at with that, honestly. I don't think it's very... I don't know. I don't think it's something definite. I think it's just like... It's it's just so it funny that do... we're doing this film after we've done a couple of Birdman's. Uh, right, and like, right. <laughs> like these are all in it's the same like universe of just like... Yeah, like what is this? Especially with Persona, like really decoding things is... I mean, I know. You, you know where I fall in that camp. I like here's exactly, the thing exactly, and that's why you don't like this movie. <laughs> no, which is a here, shame. Here's the thing too. I don't dislike this movie. I like it. Just dis like it's like unwrapping the best piece of candy you've ever seen in your life, but someone dropped it on the floor and there's like a couple hairs on it. That's what it's like. Whereas <laughs> like the rest of Tarkovsky's films are like clean candy. Greg, you're the one who just wanted to dissect the opening. I didn't even suggest that. No, no, no. I mean, look, I think it's fun to an extent. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But I'm just saying, like, Tarkovsky, especially as a filmmaker, where I don't put that much thought into, like, what what this scene really... But uh, that's what I'm saying. You don't need to for this movie. It's almost like Space Odyssey. Hmm. Like, you know how in Space Odyssey... Well, Space we Odyssey just, like... has a through line, though, in terms of, like... So does this. It's about, like, haziness and memory and right. childhood and... Yeah. Yeah, I guess Space Odyssey, especially if you read the book, which we talked about in our episode, is that that whole Stargate sequence, there is an A, B, C. Like, this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Like, and Tarkovsky's, or sorry, Kubrick is just shooting it in a really sort of uh, abstract way. But with this, there's not such a clear definition. It's like, oh, this could kind of be this. This could also be this. I think what's so cool about Tarkovsky's films, uh, they are this dream world. Like, it is a dream world that you can enter and it's unlike anything in my life. So yeah. there's a museum here in LA. It's actually in Culver City called the Museum of Jurassic Technology. Have you been there? No. Have, have, you, have you heard of it? Do you know no. what it is? Jurassic Technology? Okay, so it's so cool. You have to go. But essentially what it is, is it's like an art piece on museums. So you go in and it's really dark. It's very dimly lit. I also the the one time I went there I was stoned out of my mind. <laughs> like my friends and I were smoking some weed beforehand and then like I left my wallet in the car so I like ran and then by running I got even higher and I was like <laughs> my by the time I got there my friends were already inside so I just kind of stumbled through oh like so stoned but like so I should go back when I'm like sober but it is unreal. It is just like it taps into that same sort of like dream world that tarkovsky like the whole time i was in there i was like i want to watch stalker right now (laughs) and uh yes it's like the closest i've seen to like a physical manifestation of like it's probably the best way to describe it is it's part tarkovsky part like quay brothers do you know them no these kind of like avant-garde stop motion animated films that are like also very nightmarish and surreal and unsettling but like in a really great way Anyway, that's, I don't know where I was going with that. When you said but. Jurassic technology, it's I a, literally thought you meant like like uh, the sticks that cavemen use to make fire. No, because there were no there were no humans in Jurassic times. So that that's the whole pun on the name. Oh. Like there was no Jurassic technology. <laughs> that's so funny. But it's cool because it's this weird winding crate like there's weird like stuffed animals like in like like uh taxidermy animals behind glass. I remember there's this room where it's like a bunch of like model like trailers, like trailer parks. Yeah. And you work your way up through this this building, this museum and on each floor there's like videos you can watch and there's like string you're supposed to play with. And at the very top of the building it opens up into this like tea room. It's not even it's like a tea garden. Okay. And there was someone like gently playing guitar when I got there and they like handed me a cup what of tea. The heck? And it was like so delightful and such a contrast to the whole museum that had come before it. But it just reminded me that whole time I was like, I, I'm so, I so want to watch Tarkovsky right now. Just in terms of like that indescribable world. It's just, yeah, totally ethereal. But I find it so shocking that in the end you didn't know that those were his like young parents. You know why? Because at that point I was like kind of checked out. But it's so beautiful. Like that's my course, that's one of my favorite beautiful. parts because it's intercut with like, first of all, leading into that scene is like the last walk through through a house, right? And it's it's through these like curtains, and you're in the house, and then you land at the window, and you see a figure sitting in the distance. It's a ghost. It's not <laughs> though. It's the it's the mom <laughs> as an old woman, and right. then baby Alexi goes up to her, and you immediately I immediately thought of the line it's a little earlier when Natalia and him, his ex-wife are like having one of their discussions. And she says, 
She needs nothing but for you to become a child again so she can hold and protect you. Hmm. I love that. Maybe and if, the, there's some 2001 in this. I would be surprised if Tarkovsky yeah, hadn't seen that and been inspired by it in yeah. some way. And then you have that amazing, like, it's almost like a match on action because, like, young mom, like, turns her head and then she sees her old version of herself and then she turns back to the dad. And uh, I love it. And then the la- I love that in the last shot of the movie, it's young mom and old mom like it's the old mom walking baby alexi but then you can see young mom in the distance and she's smoking her like classic cigarette i love it yeah it's (laughs) it's really striking yeah um should we talk about the like heartbreak of it all because this is a truly in terms of like representing a divorce i think that it is so sad and it's it's so sad without ever having seen them be together and of course it has to do with the the levitating and the washing of the hair. But it's also just, it's so tender. Like I love, I love, it's the scene after the whole thing with the doctor has happened. She's walking back to the cabin and um, it's like, I think it's the first poem. Like the first poem is read and it's like a love poem and it's a beautiful love poem. And she's standing in the window and she starts, like you just see her crying while you're hearing this poetry. And like, what? Like that is, that's it's just perfect to me. Like that is, that is perfection to me. So much about this film is perfect. And then it's just, you know. What? Okay. <laughs> and then, and then you have, cause. But also who am I to say, <laughs> to critique a Tarkovsky? Like who the fuck am I? <laughs> what about. That's why, we... that's why I'm like, I feel like I'm failing this movie. Like. I'm not up to this movie's standards yet. I don't want to... I'm not judging. I don't (laughs) judge. Sometimes you do. But I just feel like if you sat down again, you're really busy right now because you have a million things going on. I know you do. And you're like rushing to do a lot of work. And I think that if you rewatched this movie at a calmer time in your life... I think you'll feel differently. And you know what? I'm going to do that. I think you should. In fact, sooner rather than later. Can we talk about, since we're on the subject of like mom and her heartbreak, can we talk about when her coworker like scolds her and like roasts her? Oh God, that comes out of nowhere? Comes out of nowhere. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's so crazy. First of all, I love the way that that scene is shot. Like I love the like frame rate and how it's slow. Oh, I was going to talk about the the slightly slowed down slow motion. Yeah, the the slightly like ever so slightly when she's running to the actual printing press. Yeah, and the sound is really heightened. You can hear her breathing and her footsteps. And his mother actually worked in a printing press, Tarkovsky. Yeah, Yeah, this movie's really autobiographical. Yeah. But like, why does the coworker roast her like that? I don't know. I don't know. It comes out of nowhere because she really, yeah, she's like laughing and stuff. And then then she's like, oh my God, you remind me of something. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I know. But it's like, I, because I, I don't know, like I read a few essays and stuff and one of them said something like, um, it just showed the way that in like Stalinist Russia, like, um, people who were like ever so like slightly self-indulgent or like selfish in a way or i don't know just like kind of not that she's a drama queen but like seeming like there's like a drama around them right like that would be like scolded yeah i i don't know but it's just but here's the thing you don't need to know that right i don't think you need to know that you just watch that scene and you're like holy shit like she's killing her right now and she's crying and i don't know yeah she really goes for it yeah yeah i also love the scene when she's like in the shower directly after oh yeah it's so good i don't know what it is about it it's like it's all about those workplace showers yeah and she ends and she's just (laughs) like oh god and she just like puts her head in oh yeah and i'm like our former uh workplace had a had a shower do you remember that didn't yeah i did on the second floor you're lying. A couple people would take showers there. You're lying. Wait, are you serious? You never went to the upstairs bathroom? No. Oh, yeah, there's a shower in there. Why? Oh, it's in the men's room only. It's in the men's room. I swear to God, it's true. Did you ever use it? I never used it. That is really weird. Yeah. <laughs> and why did the men's room only have it? I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> um, 
Okay. Did you notice that there's a there's a poster in this for Andre Rublev? Yes, I did. In Alexi's apartment. I saw that. Also so cool. I love how much of this movie is like Alexi's POV. Yes. But he does it in this really graceful way. Like it's not like this handheld. Like you you've seen it's that. It's not. Like, yeah, exactly. And yeah, maybe I could see uh, like Gaspar Noé uh, watching this and getting some inspiration for Inch of the Void or something. It's but just so this cool. like yeah, for most of the the scenes with Alexi are like POV. They it's are. almost like he's floating. That scene where he first talks to his mom on the phone and the camera just kind of yes, floats through his exactly apartment. Through his apartment. I love that. I love too that like Tarkovsky is all about natural lighting and he's all about like you're in an apartment, you can't really see things that well because it's dark and like it I love that look. That just like natural light, just what, oh, a, what about twilight when they go to look. That, that neighbor's house? Which for what house. I think oh, is an yeah, abortion, yeah, yeah. but right, yeah, I see. I don't know what the fuck was happening. There. I think it's an abortion. You know what? Honestly, he could have given us a little more. Let's just be real. <laughs> they, he could have given us a little bit. Okay, here's what happens. Right, you're gonna say that because it's through the the point of view as a, of a kid that he wouldn't have known his mom was getting an yes. abortion. So therefore, the film is potential. Like the film is uh, excused. Right, like it's no. It, that wasn't what I was going to say. I was actually going to say that when she asks her to slaughter the chicken. Uh-huh. She I'm goes, so glad we don't see it. Oh, my God. First of all, <laughs> another chicken slaughter? Like, what is with sight and sound? The people who vote on this Wait, list what was have a one? real problem with chickens. What was the other this chicken This is like one? our 12th movie with a chicken sacrifice. Oh, wait. I'm Color trying... of pomegranates. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was another. Tuki Buki, I'm pretty sure it happened. Well, that was cows, yeah. No, no, no. I think there's a chicken in that, too. You're probably right. Um, Thankfully, it's off screen. It's off screen, but she goes, oh, I can't do it. The neighbor is saying this. I can't do it. First of all, that neighbor is Tarkovsky's wife. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, she goes, oh, I can't do it. Like, I'm pregnant and I'll become sick. Right. And mom literally says, but I too. And then the, the like, neighbor's like, it. no, she means like, I'm pregnant too. Or like, but she's not technically pregnant anymore. That's the thing. Oh, I didn't get that. I thought she was just trying to get out of it because she hadn't done it before. No, she goes, but I too. And oh. the neighbor's like, you too what? Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess you're right. And then it's there. I she guess. goes into the she goes into the dream where she's levitating, and this is what she says. She says, "It's a shame I only see you when I'm sick." And if we've already established that, like killing a rooster makes pregnant women sick, come on, <laughs> it's there. Yeah, I guess you're right. I guess I didn't look deep enough. You're right. I have been busy. I, don't, I feel like I maybe it, it's funny. I watched this in the morning. I gave it a nice. I gave it the whole morning. I sat down with a cup of tea. Uh, but yeah, I need to rewatch this. I need to revisit it. It's so obvious. I love you. That I, line kills me. Yeah. I will say, going back briefly to the chicken, that hearing the chicken scream, oh. even though it's off camera, was almost enough to put me off chicken. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's a horrible scream. Yeah. The, I feel like we didn't really talk about like the cinematic language of this movie. I mean, because the cinematic language, well, we talked about the slow-mo, we talked about the look, the graceful tracking shots, the mm. the one take, the oneers. We talked about it. I mean, the natural lighting, like it's because it's its own thing. Like it's intangible, really. Like Tarkovsky is a magician. I don't know how he pulled some of this stuff off. Yeah. Because it's so graceful oh and beautiful and ethereal. And it's like, how? Yeah. What about the scene with the doctor and then when he's walking away and he stops for a moment to let the wind pass through him? Oh my God. Ugh. Yeah. Jesus That's Christ. That's beautiful. Here's the thing with burning houses too. There's a burning house in uh, it's the sacrifice, but it's like the timing. So like yeah. when we see the burn, the famous shot in this movie with the burning house, the camera it starts like in the kitchen or something at this table and turns yep. and looks into a mirror and yep. goes down a hall. Yep. And like you cannot fuck that up because this house is only going to burn for so long. And yeah, it's like exactly. I can't even imagine. And then mom going to the well and then going. Oh, like, yeah. The, the house is in the background. I love that there's like this really cool sequence while young Alexi is sitting in that neighbor's house presumably waiting for his mom's abortion to be done and um oh the, just the lantern in the corner and the stuff The lantern yeah. and then it, it goes into this sequence of like mirrors and then it lands on the girl with chapped lips oh yeah it's <laughs> they're amazing. so chapped that they're bleeding they're they bleeding. really wanted to get that point yeah. across yeah like this is her see they're bleeding yeah <laughs> and then like talking about the black and white and like the monochrome it's not even just black and white it's like sepia um 
it's like I like when there's there's this one moment it's like the second conversation he has with his wife his ex-wife and it's black did you notice it's black and white it's when the burning bush is happening and then it goes into color as he's recalling his childhood and that was like so wizard of oz as oh yeah okay me. yeah like i loved that yeah which is weird because it's always the reverse it's like the memory is in black and white right um so i really like that yeah got a car- i i forget his name but the the doctor in the beginning who's standing there as the wind blows he's a tarkovsky I, regular i love him yeah he's great he reminds he reminds me of like <laughs> he's like the soviet robert duvall <laughs> yes oh my god you're so right you're so right but like I, I i always come back to that doctor sequence because it is i feel like it is the most like cohesive you know and it's like just the camera work in that scene oh it's incredible amazing the way it like moves from like her face to the bush to like the back of her head with her hair in a bun and oh my god it's just i honestly think i think because we've talked about bergman so much recently and you know they're so connected in so many ways i do think that tarkovsky took what bergman had established and pushed it further and i do think almost in a in a way Tarkovsky's best work is almost best Bergman just because it's like he learned from the master and then he like took it to a, another level. But the thing about Bergman is that like it's just a different movie like it's, Yeah, it is. It's it a, is. It's a very small talky like well, not necessarily it depends on the well, movie, but yeah, I mean most of them are a lot of, most of them chamber are. pieces, but yeah, I mean yeah. a lot of Tarkovsky's are too. This is well, but then he had like Andre Rublev and stuff. It, it depends on the movie. It depends on the movie. But like my favorite Tarkovsky movies, like Stalker and Nostalgia and Sacrifice and stuff, like they they feel very insular. Like they're very they are very like small stories, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but told kind of like cosmically, which is the appeal, right? Whereas, like, I feel like Bergman is not told. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, I'm not trying to put down Bergman. Bergman's one of yeah, my all-time favorites. In fact, you? I feel weird. I don't know why everything always needs to be compared. I feel like there? I always jump to that. Yeah. yeah, you know how you roast me for like analyzing <laughs> shit. Why do you compare shit? I don't know. Sometimes it's like a f- easy thing to pull. You know, you're like, oh, this and this. I don't know. I I should stop doing. That. Yeah, stop. <laughs> I love both Tarkovsky and Bergman. One is not necessarily better than the other. I mean, is it even possible to choose a favorite side in this movie? Everything should that we, I yeah, have Should named. we do sight and sound? I feel like it's about time, right? Yeah. Well, that was my way of doing a cool transition. You had a great transition it. and then I made it clunky because I stepped in. <laughs> you just have to ruin everything. I do. No, let's, yeah, let's hear your sight. Well, everything that I just named well, counts. But if you have to pick one. Ugh. Okay. Considering I keep going back to this scene, I'm pretty sure it's just like the money shot of mom on the fence, like with the pink sky and she's smoking a cigarette. I know it's so like cliche. It's the cover that Criterion But it's used. just so beautiful. It's that. And if I had to tie with another one, there's this like one dream sequence where it's in black and white. And it's all these linens just like. Oh, yeah. That yeah. Is, and again, it's one of those moving through the room shots. Yeah. Oh, my God. That. I love those images when like the house is coming down, like the roof is coming yes. down. Yes. And it's like, yeah, their house is literally breaking apart. Like dad left. And yeah. It's, ugh. I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to watch this again <laughs> soon. <laughs> I might like retract this in a, a future episode and be like, I was completely wrong about Mir. <laughs> do it, do it. I also love this Spanish girl dancing. I think oh, that, yeah. that is amazing. Yeah. And she, like she gets slapped. And they're like, oh, we've been trying to teach you for years and now you dance? Like what? What a Bergman thing to do, have someone get slapped. I know, right? <laughs> What's your favorite site? E- again, mine is a bigger cop out than yours. It's the shot with the burning house. No! Yes. Not a bigger, mine is because, a bigger cop out no no because i feel like the burning house is like the most iconic image from the movie so yours is a little bit a slightly deeper cut than mine but yeah the way that the camera starts in like the kitchen the kids leave the table it like stays on the table it like it's amazing. backs out it's of the amazing. kitchen it goes down the hall it looks through the mirror then it turns around and goes out to like the porch and tracks along the porch as like this house burns i mean yeah. come on it's incredible come on you do that, you could just retire afterwards. Like, there's no. I need, would have retired if I was him. You know? I would have retired after this. But I'm so glad he didn't, because all my favorite movies like <laughs> came after this. Um. What about sound? What's your uh, favorite sound? It's so hard. Again, this one's really hard. It's a tie. 
Oh my God, it's a three way. Th- oh my God, it's a four way. What? Th- Come on, that's <laughs> excessive. Okay, fine. My pick one. Pick favorite, one. Mm, it's probably the sound of the water dripping into the basin when <laughs> that's, watching that's mine. It's so good. That's it's mine. So clean and crisp and <laughs> beautiful. But she's in slow mo, but the yeah, sound is the not sound in slow mo. Not. Another one that I love is the popping lantern when he's at that neighbor's house. And oh he's my that god! Lantern. What a striking Ooh. image that is, too. Yeah, it's, it's the image and the yeah. popping noise of the flame. I love it, and then it moves into like the coals, and then it's the girl with the chapped lips and all that jazz. God, he's so good at shooting that stuff. It's just, but it's enough to just discourage this, you for the rest of your life yeah, from and even this, attempting. And I think that this movie does such a good job of joining sight and sound so much. Like yes. every time they're doing the, the rifle too. practice, the the music, the poetry, yeah, um, the but, rifle practice, you can hear the crunching of the snow. Like yeah. uh, I love that. Yeah. Anyway, a close one for me was the uh, the last shot where the camera just goes into the woods. Yeah, it's beautiful. Fuck, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, what Pauline? does our good friend Ms. Kale say about this? So I couldn't find anything Pauline had to say about this one. I looked. Um, yeah, I searched online. I have a couple of her books from that cover this time period, and I could not find a Pauline Kale review. So I don't know. That she reviewed it because I don't think it was had this huge release. Um, yeah, I'm not surprised. Release of I'm pa- not surprised. Yeah. So, no Pauline. But... It looks like we're stuck with Letterboxd. We're stuck with the, the letterbox clowns. <laughs> <laughs> Five stars. Broken mirror in the streets. Levitating woman in the sheets. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, I've got half a star. <laughs> Peasant farmer shoe gaze. <laughs> Poetry from people who don't read poetry. It gave me nothing to relate to in the first 30 minutes, and that's when you just got to bounce. That's so funny. It's funny because we mentioned how the first 30 minutes are like kind of the strongest. Yeah, I think so. Um, Five stars. I can't explain how I feel because my eyes are full of tears, and my ears are full of Bach, and my heart is full of joy. Oh. Yeah, the Bach in this is incredible. Yes, so well used. And it's not like really, Ode really to well Joy. Used. It's not like the shit that you hear a million times. Wait, no. Ode to Joy is not Bach, is it? Fuck. Uh, Isn't that Beethoven? I think so. <laughs> but yeah, it's not the same shit that you always hear. Yeah, I love something about like classical music in movies. Oh, there's yeah. a whole there's a playlist on Spotify called Classical Movie Moments. Oh, love and it. And it's like just like the most famous songs, classical songs in movies. Um, yeah two stars here i don't think i understand history or russian cinematography enough to appreciate this film doubled up with being sleepy i got probably five percent of this movie we'll need to rewatch and check it out some more what is russian, russian cinematography? exactly mean? understanding <laughs> russian cinematography like you don't have to read eisenstein to understand an image is an, an image. image yeah it's yeah, that's some of funny. the best images ever put to celluloid. That's really funny. As indifferent as I am to this film, let it be known that the cinematography in this movie is truly like one of the greats. Is that is that you reading a review? No, or... that's me. That's me. So... Oh, <laughs> you're in. Di- you, I thought you said you liked it. Well, you said you liked it. I don't dislike it. That's what I like. I, you know, I don't know. Who knows how I feel about this movie? <laughs> okay, half a star. I don't like this guy's films. They're slow and boring and kind of badly made. <laughs> badly made. See, that's not what I, I would not say that about this film. Someone gave it two stars and said, and again, this kind of, this might sum it up for a lot of people. They say, I'd like every shot of this framed in my house, but also I'd like to never watch this ever again. Z, Z, Z. <sighs> I'm going to leave it on a funny note, a light note. <laughs> Five stars. In Soviet Russia, mind bends you. There you go. <laughs> you know, I really, I, I'm looking forward to you rewatching this. I'm looking forward to rewatching it too. But this has prompted me, like I do now, I now want to go revisit some of my Tarkovsky faves just because, you know, this this made me kind of miss them a little bit. Like, oh, I want the, the full experience. You know, I don't know. What am I saying? Who knows? I'm going to look back on this episode a couple years from now and be like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, look, we're 
our job is to be honest in the moment and our yeah. impression of the movie yeah. in that time in our lives. And this is how it resonated with me on this time. So. Yeah, of course. What are we doing next week? We are doing uh, Spirit of the Beehive. Victor Ooh. Eurice's Spirit of the Beehive, which is a great one for Halloween. We did not plan this because it is on the list. Ping pong just worked in our favor. Ping pong magic. That we will be doing a sort of Halloweeny movie for our post or for our pre Halloween episode. So exciting. So yeah, that will be our last episode for this uh before we take a break for November. So do join us next week. If you haven't seen Spirit of the Beehive and you love like Pan's Labyrinth or any of that stuff, like you must watch Spirit of the Beehive. It is basically where all of that came from. It's a great movie. It's it's a it's a beloved classic. What can I say? The basic premise is this traveling movie show of the film Frankenstein. Frankenstein, yeah. So they go around from town to town and show the film. It takes place in the 30s, I it's think. It's also funny because it's set during the Spanish Civil War, yeah. isn't it? Or like yeah. right after. I believe so. It's just ping pong. Look at yeah. that. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. But do you ever think about how weird that is? It really what are the out. odds that like two movies back to back that have nothing to do with each other both feature the Spanish Civil War? Yeah. And again, that this one lined up so well for Halloween. I just this ping pong is really it's a <laughs> it's mystery to me. So yeah, come back next week for Spirit of the Weehive. <laughs> the Weehive. <laughs> is that like the West Hollywood Beehive? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, come back next week for Spirit of the Beehive. We're going to have a great time. This has been Mirror, our first Tarkovsky, and not only. Until then, I'm Greg. I'm Jackie. And we'll see you next week. This has been an official podcast of the Arroyo Film Club. Seen and Heard is Jacqueline Pastagian and Greg Kleinschmidt. Theme music by Andrew Cox. You can find us at seenandheardpod.com.